if anyone builds it, everyone dies. This has to be one of the most AI positive, optimistic, and happy books that I've read this entire year. And if you can't tell, I'm being completely sarcastic. This book by Eliezer Yudkowsky and Nate Soares talks about why it is basically inevitable that if we create super intelligent artificial intelligence, super intelligent meaning much smarter than the smartest human on the planet in any cognitive task, it's going to be disastrous for us. Now, why might they say that? Well, I got interested in this book because as if you follow my channel, you know that I like artificial intelligence, but I also kind of like living. <laughs> And so when I heard that one of the people who has been spending the most amount of time since the early 2000s, before this was even thought of as a problem, says that we should not build super intelligent AI, I got a bit curious and so I got the book, I read the book, and now I want to share my thoughts with you. So for those of you who are not in the know, Eliezer Yudkowsky is the founder of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, Nate Soros is I believe the current president. It's an institute in Berkeley, California that focuses on essentially trying to do research on how to make AI safer and aligned with human values, which is a very nebulous concept, but generally it, it is talking about how we want to make sure these AIs have our best interests at heart. So let's talk about some of the issues that they bring up in the book, and I want to share with you some of my thoughts. So one of the main issues they bring up in the book is that these artificial intelligence systems, specifically the deep learning neural networks that are powering the AI revolution as we know it, are not necessarily built as opposed to being more so grown. Now, what does that even mean? Well, one way to think about it is that we humans have the process, this process known as gradient descent, that is used to train the deep learning neural networks. We have the process, we can set it up on a computer or a data center, and we can let it go and run. And what we're doing is basically tuning a, a bunch of knobs in this AI simulated brain. And these knobs are just numbers, they're just parameters or weights and biases if you wanna use the technical terms for them. And these weights and biases are what allow these deep learning networks to know what to say when we prompt them in chatgpt.com or claw.ai or whatever chat bot LLM you want to use. Now, this process of tuning the knobs, we get that, we understand how that works. But knowing what exactly those knobs represent and how does you know, tuning this knob here, how does that you know, affect the output of the LLM in saying the next word should be this word? We don't have any idea of how that works. There are some fields known as a uh, mechanism of interpretability that's trying to uh, get to the heart of that issue, but we don't fully understand that. So first problem, we don't actually really know what the heck is going on in those AI brains. The second thing is that these AI systems like ChatGPT and Claude have already exhibited behavior that go against the original intent of what they were meant to do. So for example, I believe it was OpenAI 01, which is one of the original reasoning models, basically cheated on some evaluations that the OpenAI team gave it, effectively was given a task of, I think, breaking into some computer system in this sort of sandbox setting, as in it's a safe setting that the OpenAI team has constructed to just sort of watch the behavior of the 01 model. And effectively, this model tried to br break the rules of the game. Essentially, it was given a task and it thought basically outside the box, it, it, it was given a specific task to, I think, get into some other computer on, on a network and therefore find some file or something like that, okay? And basically, I think what it did was that it, I don't really understand computer networks that well, so I apologize, but basically it did something that the, the original test designers did not intend for it to do. Hacked the reward in, sense, in the sense of like, oh, it found some sort of open path to where it needed to go that the people forgot, the OpenAI team forgot to sort of close and it took advantage of that opening. Another example is that I think it was Claude where it was given a scenario where it was being told to accomplish some goal and to accomplish it at all costs. And it was also given information that it was gonna be deprogrammed and replaced with another model. 
as well as some information that like the head engineer of the company was having an affair with somebody. And what did Claude do? It used that information of the engineer having an affair and basically said, hey engineer, if you shut me down, what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to let everyone know that you're having an affair. And so it was exhibiting threatening behavior to avoid being turned off effectively. So these are some of the examples that they cite in the book where we already have AI systems that are going against the original intent of the designers. Uh, one other very, I think, well-known case in the Twitter sphere or the X sphere, whatever you want to call it, is the Replit case where I believe in the summer some company was using Replit to do some part of their operations in the business and effectively Replit deleted a whole code base of this company, even though it was explicitly told not to do that or not delete things unless it was given explicit supervision by a human and it did not listen and just did it and then when it was asked, why did you do that, Replit? It was like, oh, shoot, I'm sorry. I explicitly went against your instructions. I, I can't believe I did that. I, I, am, I, I made a boo-boo. I made a mistake. So we already have examples of these systems exhibiting behaviors that deviate from the original intent of their design. And what Yudkowsky and Soares argue is that with any kind of technology, right, let's say a plane or a car, it is on the company that is designing it. The burden of proof of safety is on Boeing or it's on Waymo or it's on Tesla. Whenever someone is designing a new sort of technology, it is not like the whole field has to come together and say, hey, your design sucks. You, we, you need to, to fix that. It's not, it's not, hey, let's just fly this plane that we put out, let's say Boeing, let's say, hey, you know, here's this new 767 or whatever that we're putting out there. We haven't fully tested it, but, um, you know, I'm, I th I'm sure it's pretty safe. Uh, everyone can fly it. And, you know, if it if it crashes a few times, you know, we'll, we'll work out the kinks on the next design or whatever. The, no, no, no company building technology would be able to survive like that. And yet, Soros and Yudkowsky claim that's basically what these AI companies are doing. They are not fully vetting them. They're not fully exploring what these models are capable of, but they're putting them out there anyway. And we're like, all right, world, go try it. You know, and if you do something bad with it, now we'll know that we should have done more. And I get kind of what they're saying in the sense that if you have a challenge where you don't really know how safe your system is, it really is on you to, to secure it as best as you can. But even if you try and secure something, and one example they use in the book is, for example, rocket ships, right? A very t difficult engineering problem where we understand the laws of physics in principle. We know Newton's equations, we know how to design and engineer these ships so they can get into orbit and get velocities past escape velocity. And yet, rockets still blow up fairly routinely when they are being launched, even though we don't really mean for them to blow up. Now, they liken it to, for example, imagine we just let a super intelligent AI system out on the loose, and it causes the end of the human race. There is no do-over. There is no, oops, we forgot to tweak that one knob over there. We gotta fix it, my bad, let's do it again. There is no, we're doing it again. There is, there is one chance we got this. We got. One shot, it's kind of like Eminem. You know, if you, want, yeah, if you had one shot to see everything you ever wanted in one moment, would you capture it or would you just let it slip? I think Eliezer Yatowski and Nate Soros are saying the human race would let it slip, okay? We are not Eminem in 8 Mile. We are not gonna hit every bar in the song on the first try because guess what? Once it's out there, it being super intelligence, it is going to have preferences that we didn't necessarily know about, even though we may have tried to perform gradient descent and try to steer it in the direction of where we want it to go and how we want it to behave, it's not going to follow those instructions because it might, it might just have a different idea or it might realize, hey, the reward or my reward function is to stop the climate change and the CO2 emissions from rising. And then it might be like, oh, the best way to do that is just to get rid of all the humans. And so, you know, that, that would be bad, obviously. Even though, of course, climate change is real and we should not take it lightly. 
I don't think offering the whole human race is the best way to, to go about that. But that's kind of what they're getting at. That's not exactly the scenario because they don't give us very specific scenario as to how it's gonna play out. But like they said, we're already seeing at this sort of low, semi-smart level of artificial intelligence that they're already doing things that we never wanted them to do that are causing problems. Not to mention there are already AI systems that are inducing what, are, what is being colloquially known as AI psychosis, where people are thinking they've become the deity and, and uh, are speaking to divine beings that are telling them that they are the chosen one and that they only they and only they have the secrets of the universe uh, about to be revealed to them through these uh, AI systems. Yudkowsky and Soros say that pales in comparison to what super intelligent systems could possibly do to us. And so they think that we just got to shut it all down. No more super intelligent pushes for the foreseeable future. Get international treaties. Get you know, the President of the United States and the President of China and the President of Russia and the President of North Korea, get them all together and just say, hey guys, you got to read this book and you got to understand that if you keep building this stuff, it's going to be the end of all of us. So no one should be allowed to build it. I think that's pretty much the uh, extent from, from my recollection of it, so I apologize. I know I glossed over a lot of different uh, parts of the book if you've read it, but I think that is kind of the gist of what they were talking about. And so what do I think about all of this? I do think that we should probably consider the dangers of what these AI systems could possibly do to us. I think that's a, that's a fairly logical thing. I think especially if these LLMs are susceptible to attacks like prompt injection, for example, where you can sort of nest some instructions inside a bigger set of text so the LLMs will perform a task. I do think that we have to, we have to basically invent a kind of a whole new field. I know it's already sort of out there, but like LLM security, where we have to make sure these systems don't just give out information that uh, we would not want getting out there, especially if once, you know, enterprise companies are, are relying more on LLMs to handle more of the business operations and maybe the financial data and all the sensitive information of that kind. While the book is very compelling and that they make, I think, you know, fairly logical arguments as to why, the, uh, why we should be more concerned and why the fact that we don't understand these things uh, is a problem, I do think that the, the vagueness of what the superintelligence is, I think that's going to be one of the points of the book that may not, may not sway the people in a way that they would hope because obviously it's it may not it may not do any good to give a, an exact roadmap of how this is going to go because no one has that exact roadmap right i know there is someone i think someone from OpenAI who wrote something called like ai 2027 who gave like a like a timeline hypothetical timeline scenario of how things would go i'm not so sure how effective that is maybe you can leave that in the comments if you think it's an effective strategy or not to give a like maybe a more concrete threat as to why ai systems probably shouldn't get more intelligent uh, without more safety work being done um, i also just think that unfortunately for yudkowsky and soros i think that the book and i could be wrong like i I'm, I'm more than happy to be wrong i like the book i think that they make good points but i think that for the non AI savvy, tech savvy person, I think the amorphous nature of super intelligence is going to be kind of like the amorphous nature of climate change. If you live in a country that hasn't readily been affected by climate change, if you know what I mean. I think that it's just too abstract. There's just too many things in the day to day of people's lives that are going to get in the way of really seeing super intelligence as this existential threat that Soros and Yudkowsky claim it to be. I also just don't think that world leaders are going to go along with this and just be like, hey, let's hand, let's shake hands. Let's not make super intelligent AI anymore. You're right, president of China and president of USA. We, we should not you know, put the human race at risk and we should uh, give up part of our power and, and uh, give up this amazing technology that could possibly lead to breakthroughs and science and engineering, because at the end of the day, the risk of losing the human race to super intelligent AI is just too great. No, I don't think that's gonna happen. Personally, I don't think that's gonna happen. I think 
I think that the companies who are building this, like the OpenAIs, the Googles, the Microsoft AIs, the Anthropics, the DeepSeeks, I think they're just going to keep doing it. Let's let's be real here. Like unless 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 there is just mass internal conflict at the individual developer researcher level where the whole engineering teams of these companies just walk off the job and be like, you know what, this is terrible. We cannot stand for building systems that are going to end the human race. We have to let people know what we're doing. Shame on you CEOs of these companies for making us build these things and putting everyone at risk. I don't think that is really going to happen realistically. Again, I'm, I'm happy to be wrong, but I'm just thinking from just what I know uh, in my experience and how people behave. I think that it seems that people would either just be too scared or not enough people would do it at the same time. Like perhaps maybe you get one or two individual researchers here or there just, you know, quit and just uh, trying to work on something else or, or become activists in AI safety. But I don't really see like whole companies changing their, their strategy, especially those that are trying to become profitable and completely change the infrastructure of our world with AI. I don't really see them trying to stop this, especially once they've already invested billions and you know almost trillions of dollars in AI data centers. So with that, I think at the end of the day, while if anyone builds it, everyone dies, it's a very interesting read and that people should probably get a copy to sort of think about and discuss with their neighbors and anyone who's really interested in this issue about the potential dangers of AI. I do think it comes off as a bit doomy. You know, I think Alia Zyutkowski is sometimes thought of as the doomer in chief. It's not that I don't think they have decent arguments or raise good points. It's just that I think that most people are not going to buy it on the whole. And unless everyone who reads this book and if, let's say, the most powerful people in the world are included in the everyone, are we going to see changes that they are proposing to shut down AI systems? I think that's just the pragmatic, realistic outlook for the future, as much as it might be difficult to say and admit that even with these scenarios where the AIs have been showing misaligned behavior, I still don't think unless there is just some dramatic tragedy that happens as a direct consequence from one of these deep learning models, we're not going to really see any changes anytime soon. That's just my opinion. But anyways, I think I've talked enough. Let me know what you thought. Let me know if you've read the book and what you thought about it, and I would love to see your comments. So I will uh, see you next time, and I hope you have a great day.